All right, so you've made it to the, the last lecture. Um, so the, following this style of everything so far, so far there'll be kind of an introductory lecture for the, the last module, and then there'll be a, a brief intro to the hands-on tutorial, uh, and then we'll go through the last hands-on tutorial, uh, which I think compared to the last one, you'll find quite lightweight. Uh, so it doesn't have a lot of R and multiple optional scripts being run and so forth. Okay, so this module is isoform discovery and alternative expression. Um, and the kind of the main goal is to provide a working example of um, sort of a, a, a splicing version of how you would run the cufflinks pipeline. So in terms of specific objectives for this mod module, really the main one, the main technical one is to explore the use of cufflinks in um, this what they call reference annotation phase transcript assembly mode and de novo assembly mode. Um, so even though they're calling this de novo assembly, both of these modes do require a reference genome. So there's kind of a lot of terminology here and this word de novo gets used a lot. A lot of people when they hear de novo, they think really of de novo, de novo assembly and that can be totally reference free. Uh, and there is a whole area of RNA-seq tool development and algorithm development that is really focused on building assemblers that can take raw RNA-seq reads and assemble them into transcripts without any notion of what the reference looks like at all. So it's just based on the similarity between reads and inferring that, that these reads would be part of uh, a contig and building these contiguous sequences and then later you would try to map them back to reference sequences or just annotate them directly as transcripts. Um, and that's quite a challenging problem. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's more difficult than uh, aligning reads against a high quality reference. Yes, Francis? They met Jared earlier. Right, so yeah, Jared, I guess, gave a lecture on the topic of... Not on this topic, but de novo assembly. On de novo assembly, yeah, okay. So in the, in the uh, table that I referenced, uh, for RNA-seq, I've tried to give some recommendations for uh, de novo transcriptome assemblers uh, that are kind of specific to RNA-seq. Uh, of course, they sort of lean on a lot of the, the methods uh, and algorithms of the sort of assembly field as a whole, but they've kind of been tested on RNA-seq data. And there are some problems with assembling RNA-seq data that are kind of particular to RNA-seq. Uh, so there's this issue with uh, a lot of uh, genes having multiple isoforms, which is what we're going to talk about in a bit, and that makes assembly quite difficult. So you have, there's a lot of ambiguity when you have all of these isoforms being expressed from one locus, and they are different, and they have uh, functionally significant differences, but in terms of sequence, those differences can be fairly subtle. So they may share most of their sequence, but have you know one exon swapped out with a different exon or a slightly different exon boundary, uh, and that uh, complicates the the stre the goal of assembling a transcriptome uh, from scratch. So unfortunately we don't have time to, to cover that, uh, that area, but we, so what the type of uh, assembly that we're going to do uh, is with cufflinks and it uses the reference. So we're going to start with our reads that have been aligned against a reference genome and then using that information we're going to try to assemble transcript structures from the reads that have been aligned to the genome. And there's sort of two modes. Uh, one is where we're in addition to having the reference genome as a guide, we're going to have a reference transcriptome as a, uh, as a guide. So that's the GTF file that we got from Ensemble. We could have gotten it from other sources of an uh, transcript annotation. Uh, and then the, the final mode is where we don't even supply that uh, reference transcriptome. Uh, we're just going to go straight from the BAM to what Cufflinks thinks the transcripts look like based on the read data that was aligned to the reference genome. So just to remind ourselves where we are kind of, um, again, we're looking at these uh, mature mRNA molecules in RNA-seq often, uh, and then this module is really concerned with the alternate ways that a transcript can go from a pre-mRNA molecule with the introns in place to a mature mRNA molecule where the introns have been spliced out. Uh, for many, if not most human gene genes, there are multiple ways that this happens for each gene to produce multiple versions. Uh, multiple uh, multiple isomers or uh, isoforms for each gene. <clears throat> and this is a whole field of RNA-seq, and we're just going to pretty much do a, like a, an introduction to it. 
there's a huge number of papers and tools and labs out there that are really focused on this problem. Uh, and what I'm referen referencing here is actually a specific paper. This is a, was published as a, in the archive, uh, but I think it might actually be published uh, somewhere else now. Uh, and they provide uh, a table that's really focused on all of the different tools and methods that have been published so far uh, that relate to alternative expression, alternative splicing analysis uh, using RNA-seq data. <coughs> and then this slide is kind of just provided again as a reference. So here's uh, some Biostar posts that have really uh, started to answer some of the, the big high-level questions about how to detect alternative splicing uh, and identify differential alternative splicing, uh, try to understand the cuff links and cuff dip output as it uh, relates to alternative splicing, how to visualize alternative splicing, and so forth. Uh, so just to kind of give you a sense of the complexity of alternative splicing that we're talking about here, or alternative expression is sort of a more general term that includes uh, alternative transcript initiation and polyadenylation. Uh, so if we think about a very simple transcript model, uh, so here's a region of the genome with uh, three exons and two introns. Uh, and a simple splicing path is shown where we're going to basically connect exon 1 to 2 and 2 to 3. The introns will be removed and we'll get a mature uh, mRNA that's polyadenylated with exons 1, 2, and 3 joined together. Uh, alternative transcript initiation is the process by which we start, basically have different transcript start sites. So we could have uh, transcript initiation happening here at exon 1 or happening here at exon 2. And that would give us two alternative isoforms that differ uh, at their five prime ends, so this one has an extra exon uh, relative to that one. Alternative splicing uh, has uh, several different uh, well-established forms. So one of them, is, or perhaps the most famous or simple, is just exon skipping. Uh, so where we have two paths through some set of exons, where we include exons one, two, three, or perhaps skip exon two, and then this gives us uh, exons that have the same beginning and end, but something in the middle uh, is different. Uh, you can have alternative uh, five prime splice sites being used. So in this case, we have uh, two different donor sites that are being used, uh, one that starts here and one that starts a little bit further to the right. Uh, and then this can, again, give you a potentially quite subtle difference uh, at the level of the final transcript where we've got basically a longer uh, version of exon 2 being used. The same thing uh, can happen at the three prime end where we get uh, an extra piece uh, of sequence being used as a part of exon three. So these are different alternate acceptor sites being used. Again, they give us slightly different isoforms. Uh, a special form of exon skipping is the use of mutually exclusive exons, where you basically have a exon 2A or exon 2B that are used. So you have completely different uh, exons being used in the middle here. Uh, the entire intron might be retained in some cases. Uh, usually this is short introns that get retained. Uh, and often there'll be a non-functional product, but it, it does happen. So we can have a regular transcript here and then one that effectively has a very long exon 2 that contains the intron plus all of what was considered exon 2 and 3 in this isoform. And then alternative polyadenylation is where we basically have alternate 3 prime ends to a transcript. So the transcript either ends here at one exon or it ends uh, at a downstream exon. And this gives us differences at the 3 prime end of the transcript. And this is, you know, these types of patterns have been studied for a long time uh, with various techniques that have gradually become uh, more and more high throughput. Uh, so sort of the uh, early technique that was used, it's very low throughput, but it's still considered a, a gold standard approach is to basically sequence full length cDNAs, uh, to clone those cDNAs into vectors, uh, and then to sequence uh, through the vector uh, by some uh, combination of N and sequencing and primer walking to give you basically a contig that represents the complete cDNA sequence. Uh, and you do this many times, and over time you gather what the alternative isoforms are for a particular locus. Uh, that's a very slow, uh, labor-intensive, uh, not very high throughput method. Uh, slightly more high throughput method is to do targeted full ortho uh, cDNA sequencing, because now you're not uh, relying on sort of random selection of, of clones. Uh, you can really uh, target the, the region that you want to sequence, and then you can really discover the, the variations that happen in between the areas you targeted, but it, it doesn't really help you with uh, discovering alternate polyadenylation and transcription start sites. Uh, 
for a long time we were generating and sequencing large EST libraries where we would just randomly create lots and lots of cDNA clones and then sequence them from their ends uh, and we would learn about how exons were included or skipped near the ends of cDNAs but we didn't generally get a full picture uh, of what the transcript looked like. So it's kind of analogous to RNA-seq but the reads would generally be much longer. Again, it's not very high throughput. Uh, and then uh, probably about 10 years ago, the really more high throughput methods uh, for studying uh, alternative expression came out and these included things like CAGE, SAGE, and GIS that use different combinations of basically sequencing uh, the ends of transcripts in a, in a more high throughput fashion by sequencing little tags that are derived from the five prime or three prime or both the five prime and the three prime end of transcripts. Uh, and then next gen sequencing started and that really revolutionized the field of exploring transcript diversity, uh, starting with 454 uh, and Selexa, uh, where we were able to suddenly basically shotgun sequence a transcriptome with uh, millions and millions of short reads at a relatively low cost. Uh, and this has just started to really increase in the last few years, where we can now get large numbers of reads that are in the 1 to 200 range at a relatively cheap cost. Yes, Francis. like PacBio or Nanopore? I mean, if you actually deal with this whole, there's still a problem to deal with other splicing sorts of until you have everything in there. Yeah, so there's a huge advantage. So remember we talked about this yesterday, how, how much inference goes into trying to understand what a full-length isoform looks like based on these paired 100 base pair reads. You really, there's a lot of guesswork there. Um, and it's really suboptimal when you're trying to understand what the full length transcripts look like. And it's just never going to be as accurate as if you could actually sequence each cDNA from end to end. So you can already do this to some degree on the PAC bio. Um, it's not nearly as high throughput as RNA-seq on the Illumina platform, but you can get pretty good quality data. So I guess that right now it's kind of like a more efficient way of doing maybe the full length cDNA sequencing or the full ORF cDNA sequencing. And I have seen a few groups doing that. It doesn't seem to have really become wildly popular, but it, I've seen some really impressive results from that approach. Um, and there's also the, you know, the read lengths are getting longer on the Illumina platform. That helps a bit. It's a bit hard to imagine right now that they will go from, you know, at the rate that they're increasing. So we're, you know, doing 125 base pair reads on the X10 platform and, you know, on the MySeq you can do 200, 250 maybe. Um, so, and it hasn't really been increasing. The length has not been on the same kind of trajectory that the throughput has been where we keep getting more and more throughput. The length seems like it's more kind of stabilized. It's difficult to increase the length on the Illumina platform. So maybe something like Nanopore where you're literally feeding molecules through a pore and reading the sequence off as it goes through that pore. If they can make that cheap and robust and relatively at least medium to high throughput, it could really again revolutionize um, transcriptomics with respect to alternative splice uh, detection and um, abundance estimation. And that would be that would be great. Yeah. No. Two disparate molecules that are not connected on the chromosome are used, and if you use the PCR, they're real. And yeah. Yeah. So that's a whole other Pandora's box um, that a lot of alternative splicing methods kind of gloss over. Uh, so a lot of them start with the assumption that you know, a locus is, can be quite big and the introns can be quite large, but they are coming from a single chromosome for the most part. Um, and trans analysis that will be able to accommodate the concept of transplacing uh, needs to be tweaked to, to accommodate that idea. And it's similar uh, in a lot of ways uh, analytically to the fusion discovery uh, type analysis. So a lot of people will kind of conceptually lump some parts of alternative expression analysis in with fusion detection uh, because you're looking for these novel forms of transcripts. In some cases, transcripts that are quite bizarre um, and they can even be chimeric 
in the sense of incorporating content from different chromosomes, either because of um, a somatic event, like a rearrangement where two chromosomes have actually come together, or because of transplicing where the transcriptional machinery is somehow jumping from one template to another um, by, as yet, not super established uh, methods. Yeah, circular RNAs, another. <laughs> the transcriptome is a bottomless pit of complexity and weirdness. Uh, yeah, circular RNAs. Yeah. As I think that these areas are like quite, still quite undeveloped and novel in terms of analysis. So people that are working in these areas are really, you know, doing pretty cutting edge stuff to think about these weird events. Um, there's also a lot of classes of RNA that have been, you know, understudied. So there's been like a bit of a, a gold rush of people looking at different weird subtypes of small RNAs, at circular RNAs, at transplicing. RNA editing, all of these kind of interesting aspects of RNA biology that are, you know, generally the sort of forgotten stepchild compared to just mRNA uh, transcripts that make a protein. But they're, you know, they're all super interesting, of course. Any other questions? All right, I think this might be the, almost the last slide. Um, so back to cufflinks. So Cufflinks tries to um, automate some analysis related to alternative expression that doesn't cover all of the, the interesting stuff that we just talked about, but covers sort of a targeted slice of it. Uh, and there's sort of three uh, main uh, assays, if you will, that are done by uh, Cufflinks. Um, and those three are basically looking at uh, transcription start sites so basically what happens is after we run cufflinks and we get some notion of what all the transcripts look like, um, cufflinks comes along and it tries to break the transcripts into categories that uh, kind of line up with certain concepts of alternative expression. So it, it finds for a particular gene locus all of the transcripts that, for example, have the same transcript start site and, and then contrast them with those that have a different transcript start site. So for this a uh, simple example where we have three transcripts. We have two groups of transcripts that differ by their transcript start site. We've got the TSS1 group and the TSS2 group uh, that either start at this exon or start at that exon. So it's going to do a, a test that basically, instead of looking at the level of individual transcripts, it's going to group the transcripts and it's going to say how much uh, expression is using this promoter or this transcript start site versus how much expression uh, is using this uh, transcript start site. So that, that's the first category. Um, the second category is, um, I don't know exactly the order, but there's also uh, alternate use of exons uh, and there's uh, alternate CDSs. Uh, so this, the coloring uh, B is, I guess, so the second one is exon skipping. So it's basically looking at the inclusion or exclusion uh, of this exon. Uh, so we have one uh, isoform here that doesn't include uh, exon 2. And then the third category is, do they differ in terms of the part of the transcript that actually is translated to protein? So uh, taking all of the transcripts and breaking them down into unique ORFs and then summarizing at the level of ORF instead of at the level of transcripts with respect to where the exons start and stop. So you can see that sort of fat bars here, this is a convention uh, in depicting transcripts of, as cartoons that you have this thin part uh, that is the 5' UTR uh, and then it gets fat here so that's where the open reading frame starts uh, and then it continues through this exon uh, and then goes into the third exon and then ends and then you have the 3' UTR so the, the CDS portion is this fat part here uh, so we can see we have one, CDS, one transcript that has this long uh, coding sequence and then these other two transcripts have this shorter coding sequence so one of the, another one of the tests that it's going to do is basically comparing uh, all of the usage of this long CDS to all of the usage of uh, the short CDS and grouping whatever transcripts need to be grouped together to do that comparison. So the couplings will do the kind of pairwise comparison with all other categories? Yeah, so it automatically does those three, the sort of, uh, actually these are, 
Okay, they've been, I guess, reordered here relative to up there. But uh, it does like a, a splicing level comparison where it's really focusing on the usage of exons. Uh, it does the promoter level comparison uh, where it's looking at the different uh, transcript start size usages. And then it does the coding sequence comparison where it's looking at the usage of different uh, coding sequences. And each of those tests get kind of divided into these three arms. So you get three output files and then the differential expression results in each of those output files corresponds to each of these three ways of thinking about alternative expression. The sort of splicing analysis, the promoter analysis, and the CDS analysis. And these are the way the files will be named when they come out of uh, the cufflinks run. Okay. It's... Yeah, so we're going to talk more about those modes right now. Um, it's doing it <coughs> um, potentially without use of a reference transcript dome, um, but all of it still relies on the reference genome. Um, so we still have our reads being aligned to the re human reference genome sequence in this case. And then it's just how we're using or not using the GTF file that contains sort of transcript models. So, in this module, we're going to learn how to run cufflinks in the, the reference only mode, is what we've already done. So, you guys, that's basically what you've done up to this point. You supplied a GTF and you basically told cufflinks, tell me about the abundance of these transcripts as they're defined in the GTF by ensemble. Um, but now we're going to sort of move on from that into the reference guided and the de novo mode. Uh, and we're going to learn to use cuff merged combined transcriptomes for multiple cufflinks runs and compare assembled transcripts to known transcripts. That's going to help us get a sense of what transcripts are novel versus what transcripts line up with known transcripts. Um, and then we're going to perform the differential splicing analysis with cuff diff. Um, we're not really going to dig too deeply into the output of those. We'll sort of do like a brief introduction uh, to the output of uh, those analyses. And then we're also going to step back and actually look at uh, the output from the top hat alignment itself. So even without cufflinks, you already get some fairly rich uh, raw material to do splicing analysis right from top hat. So one of the things top hat does after uh, all of the reads have been aligned to the reference genome is it finds all of the reads that span across exon exon boundaries and it summarizes those specifically in a separate file which is called the junctions.bed file and what that file does is give you one line for every exon exon connection uh, that was observed in your RNA-seq data and then it gives you the counts so the number of reads that corresponded to each exon exon connection uh, and you can use that raw count information to build quite a rich view of the splicing that's going on in the transcriptome that you sequenced. Um, and it's a fairly straightforward file to start with uh, that doesn't involve even running uh, cufflinks. So we're going to visualize that junction counts file uh, in IGV. Um, and we're also going to look at some of the, the transcripts that are assembled by IGV in, uh, as well. OK, so the ref guided and de novo mode. So we've already run cufflinks in reference only mode. Uh, but now we want to sort of have more potential to identify novel genes and novel isoforms of known genes. Uh, and this is, if you ask the, the cufflinks authors, these are kind of the ways that they actually recommend that you run cufflinks. They, so they are you know, quite keen on this sort of uh, hypothesis or let more hypothesis-free way of interrogating the data. Um, so I think if you look in some of their publications, they will just skip right to using the, the reference-guided or de novo mode. <laughs> So in the reference guided mode, we're going to use a known transcriptome, but it's going to be used just to guide cufflinks. Uh, and cufflinks will still try to predict novel isoforms on top of that. Um, in the de novo mode, we're not even going to give cufflinks a GTF file at all. So it's just going to try to assemble the transcripts completely from scratch. Um, <clears throat> and the way you control these modes is all based on the use of basically what options you specify when you run cufflinks in the first place. Uh, and they all confusingly are named uh, G, uh, and they have, but they generally have a longer version as well. Uh, so Top Hat, just to remind ourselves, Top Hat has this dash G option, uh, and that is 
is not what we're talking about here, but just to try to uh, avoid some of the confusion, um, when we ran Top Hat, we su supplied a GTF file and it used that to build a transcriptal mm -hmm. uh, reference sequence to align reads against to help uh, the alignment process. And any reads that aligned to one of those transcripts were then kind of converted back to reference genome coordinates so that they could be displayed along with the reads that align directly to the reference genome. Um, Topout also has a small g option, uh, which is used to specify the maximum number of multi-mappings for a single read, and again, that is completely unrelated to what we're talking about in terms of alternative splicing. It just happens to be a g. Um, but Cufflinks has this big G option, and that's what we used so far. So we supplied Cufflinks with a GTF file, and we told Cufflinks, these are the transcripts that we expect in, this, in the human species. Uh, so these are the things that we want you to try to summarize in terms of their abundance. Cufflinks also has this small G option, which you also use to supply a GTF file. But when you use the small G, you're telling Cufflinks to use this GTF to guide the assembly but to not limit itself to that to those transcripts. So it's going to try to predict novel transcripts from the data. If you run cufflinks without either the big G or the little G option, so you don't give it a GTF file at all, this is what we're calling the de novo mode. So there's we're not helping it uh, with any kind of model of the transcriptome uh, that was pre-existing. We're just going to rely on the raw data and try to predict transcripts. Um, and then CuffDiff has uh, also a way of being supplied a GTF file, but for some reason they decided to just make that uh, a file path that you put at the end of the command without actually specifying uh, an option parameter. Uh, it just it's detected by the order in which you place it in the command. So I think this is like kind of like a bad. This whole system is kind of a bad design, considering these things were all created by the same group. They've introduced a lot of confusion potentially. Um, so I mentioned this top hat junctions bed file. Uh, so this comes right out of top hat. After the top hat completes its alignment, it summarizes all the reads that support exon exon junctions. So for example, you might have a readout that says exon one being connected to exon two. There were five reads that supported that connection. So five instances where a part of a read aligned to exon one and then the alignment continued on into exon two. Um, and then you might have nine reads that, where the alignment started in exon one and continued into exon three. Uh, so when you see this right away, you have evidence potentially for exon two being skipped, that there's a transcript being expressed that is not including exon two uh, because you can't uh, skip from exon one to three uh, and include two since splicing generally goes in a linear direction. Uh, so this potentially tells you about alternative splicing that's going on just by looking at the, the counts for these junctions. Uh, it sort of summarizes at the level of unique exon exon junctions and all of, and the observed read counts for each, and this is in bed format, and it's relatively simple format, so you get basically one line for each of these junctions, and then in the fifth column is basically the number of reads that support each exon exon connection. Have we handled three prime bias yet? Uh, we talked about it a little bit, Yes, this is raw. So, so we might have an exon skip forward, and it could be quite a bias. An exon skip that's forward. I would say that three prime n bias would limit your ability to see the connection of exons at the five prime end of transcripts. So if you saw signs of having alternate start sign, but you skipped exon one, that would be either because you're skipping exon one or because you're having yeah, so determining the where transcription starts um, is definitely an application that's quite <laughs> affected by 3' end bias because, like you say, um, if you don't have coverage at the 5' end uh, because of a problem with your library, then you, you're missing that information. And if you have two libraries and one of them has really bad 5' prime end bias and the other one doesn't, it might look like there's alternate transcript initiation going on just like you're describing, but really it's just that you're seeing a difference in the amount of uh, 3' prime end bias between your two libraries. So it's something that's you know you really have to watch out for um, when you're comparing two libraries in the context of alternative splicing. You ideally want the coverage to not be 
bias towards the five prime or three prime end, and you want the the profile of coverage from the end, beginning to the ends of transcripts to be quite consistent from one condition to the next condition that you want to compare. Uh, and there are some tools that will give you the, uh, sort of a, a printout of that what that profile looks like, and you'll often see that it has kind of like a horseback shape where the transcript length is displayed along the x-axis, so the five prime end is at one end and the three prime is at the other end, and then there'll be kind of a histogram that shows you sort of where your reads are kind of piling up, and you want that to be as close as possible to a uniform distribution where you have nice even coverage from the five prime end to the three prime end of your transcripts. Uh, not exactly. Um, I have to check. And so I just actually had this conversation before, and it's actually it's not super simple to translate this mentally into the junk edges of the exons that you think about when you're thinking about exon-exon connections. Um, I think that there's like an offset and a length. And, a, and a, like a reference starting point, and between those three sets of coordinates or sizes, you can construct what the edges of the exons are, but it's a little bit of math to work that out. It's, that doesn't immediately come out of this, these numbers. So when you look at it, it doesn't immediately make sense what you're looking at. Um, there's, there's a little bit of math that you need to do uh, to basically get from this form to the left edge of the first exon or the, sorry, the right edge of the first exon and the left edge of the second exon. Um, and that, so I, I did this, I worked this out like several years ago and I wrote uh, a Perl module that basically converted this file into something that was more like what you, that, to me that's the more intuitive way to represent a junction. Um, but you know, if we sat down, we could, we could figure it out again. It's not, it's not that crazy. Um, um, but this is something that IGB, has built into it that it, it can take the, that file and convert it into these uh, little arcs that do correspond to the edges of each axon. So uh, this is uh, some RNA-seq data where we've taken the junctions.bed file and we've loaded it into IGV and we're looking at what Top Hat found in terms of reads that aligned across junctions. Uh, and you can see that they line up quite nicely with the expected junctions of a, a gene that happens to be in this region. Uh, so you've got, for example, reads that span from here to here, which appears to line up quite nicely with the, uh, the edges of these two exons here. Uh, and in this case, we've got apparently nice coverage. So we're seeing representation for uh, junctions that are at the five prime end, the middle, and the three prime end. So we've basically reconstructed all of the connections uh, that are known for uh, this uh, transcript. And... There might be, there might be evidence. So there's actually evidence for a novel exon relative to this gene model that's being shown um, by the observations of these junctions. Can you can you see where it is? The small one on the top row. The small one on the top. Well, how far from the right or from the left? In the, top, in the top row. Four. This guy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So this junction. Or apparently there were some reads that spanned from here to here, uh, which appears to line up with the edge of this exon, uh, but then seems to be lining up with an edge here, and there's no an exon annotated there. Uh, and then we have another junction down here that seems to be coming from the edge of this known exon that's also coming over to around the same place, probably the other end of this exon that is apparently a novel exon that wasn't known to uh, RefSeq, I think, where these, it's either RefSeq or UCSC that these, these transcript models are coming from. So there you go, sort of like a, a, a quick example of how you can identify evidence for novel isoforms. So you don't know what the whole isoform looks like, but you have some evidence that, that there is some isoform that involves known exons from this gene but also seems to be using a, a novel exon that wasn't previously annotated. And the input file for this is a bed file? Yeah, it's this, this junctions.bed file that is coming automatically produced when you run top hat.
And I think it's just a little module that is part of the top hat, a liner that runs at the end that basically can, goes through the BAM file and generates this, this output from it. Yeah? They're just counts, so yeah, um, you don't really have a sense of how believable each of these junctions should be. Um, it will limit them to uh, expected, for the most part, you get um, actual splice sites, so the junctions are usually checked to make sure that they correspond to canonical junctions. Um, or, or you can annotate them yourself with respect to canonical splicing patterns so that you that would increase confidence that it might actually be real um, is if it actually uses something that looks like a donor site or an acceptor site um, which is fairly well established for human um, obviously like with other aspects of uh, RNA seq or other types of high throughput sequencing more read, more reads that support the same event gives you more confidence one read is a bit hard to get too excited about one read that suggests something, but if you have a hundred of them and they all kind of start and stop at slightly different places, it makes it less likely it's an alignment artifact. So there are things you can do to, to make yourself more confident, but it doesn't, it's a, this tool doesn't give you like a p-value, it doesn't take those things into account, so you would have to add your own sort of notion of that. Um, and there are probably bunch of the tools that I list in the in the resources table that do some of those take some of those concepts into account. Yeah, that's a great idea. So we're gonna yeah we're gonna do that uh, in a few minutes, and you can see how the alignments of the actual reads corresponds with the summary of the junction counts that Top Hat produced. Okay, so cuff merge. We're going to run cuff merge, uh, and what cuff merge does is basically combines transcripts that were predicted from multiple runs of cufflinks into one view of the transcriptome. Uh, so this is something that you would do. Um, say you have, uh, in our case, we have three uh, replicates for brain and three replicates for the universal human uh, reference uh, RNA. Uh, and you're going to run cufflinks in this de novo mode. In each of them, you're going to try to predict what transcripts are present. But because of differences in coverage or just random sampling, you don't get exactly the same transcripts being predicted in each of those six uh, runs. Uh, cuff merge is a way of basically unifying all of your runs back to like a single view of the transcriptome so you can come up with a single uh, set of transcripts that you're then going to get abundance estimates for. It's basically like taking the union of transcripts that were observed across multiple runs of, of cufflinks. Uh, and you can also use cuff merge to then compare those transcripts back to a known GTF file. So when we're running uh, cufflinks in the de novo mode, it's not going to know anything about the structure of human transcripts. It's going to try to predict their structure based on the data. But when we get to the end, uh, we may want to compare the transcripts that were predicted back to whatever our notion of known transcripts is to get some sense of which transcripts line up with known transcripts we already knew about, which look like they might be novel. Uh, so this is sort of a workflow that would be really applicable if you have a species that, where the transcriptome isn't very well annotated. You have some preliminary sense of transcripts uh, for that species, uh, but you're really you're using cufflinks because you want to discover novel transcripts. So you would run it in the de novo mode, and then you would use cuff merge to compare the result back to whatever you, whatever your current notion of the transcriptome was, and it'll allow you to sort of bin your transcripts into, okay, this one really matches a known transcript, and these ones don't match any known transcripts. So that's going to be your bin of things that you might uh, attempt to validate as potentially new transcripts in your species. Um, so we're going to do a comparison of merged GTFs from each cufflinks mode and look for subtle differences in what uh, transcripts are predicted in each of the modes, uh, which is what's being depicted here. Um, and here, so we're seeing, for example, uh, in the reference only mode, 
uh, we're getting this one transcript being summarized. In the de novo mode, we're getting a bunch of different transcripts being predicted. Um, and you can see that you know, they have a lot of similarities, but then there's just little cell differences. So uh, Cufflinks is predicting that there's a transcript that starts here instead of over here where the rest of these transcripts start. Uh, it's also predicting that there's a transcript that is retaining this little intron here uh, instead of having the, the intron that the other transcripts have. Uh, and then there's probably other little subtle differences that are outside the, the zoomed in view right here. Okay, so the last thing before we move into the last tutorial uh, is this question that we've sort of addressed already, which is what, a, what happens when you get back to your own lab and none of this stuff works. Um, or there's some problem, um, or they update the tool or the path. URLs are all busted. I mean, the URLs like break like it's almost like bi-weekly that we have to update that wiki um, because things are just constantly being shifted around. And um, so inevitably, you're going to have you know questions even if you just try to run the cufflinks like the tuxedo suite exactly as we've described it here. You know, you're probably going to encounter questions. It's pretty complicated when you start really digging into all of the different options and parameters. Um, so you know, feel free to post questions um, on Biostars and we'll probably see them there. Uh, that's sort of the, the best way. If, that, if your question isn't already asked on Biostars, that is, then, then go ahead and ask it there. Um, if no one replies, you know, you can try to ping us um, and your email may possibly not get buried in a massive pile of emails and we might remind us to go take a look at your question. Um, but there's also quite a lot of resources that have already been created. So the the Cufflinks authors created this troubleshooting table, which I, I find it's it's useful. Um, it's a little bit comical that they uh, some I think there's like four or five entries in it, as if that was the only thing that could possibly go wrong. Uh, <laughs> it makes it seem like there's really there's just these three things that go wrong. Um, so I guess you could check to see whether it was one of these three things, um, and you might get lucky. Um, if not, you know, it's uh, usually you're not the first person that's encountered whatever problem is happening. So you'll usually, if you Google, you'll be able to find someone who's had the same bizarre, unexplainable error message from some uh, log file. Um, and if, if you are the first person, then I guess you'll just have to work your way through it. Uh, but there is this troubleshooting t table. And then, uh, as I said, in the publication that's going to accompany this tutorial, in which I've already linked to, uh, on the citation page for the, the wiki, there's quite a, a much more extensive table of questions and answers that covers some additional um, questions and commonly encountered problems and sort of blockers that we hear about. Um, so maybe uh, you'll find the answer there as well.